Um, I'll introduce the panel chair, um, Ted Opitz, uh, and he and I, and uh, Walter's here as well, served in the Royal Regiment together way back, so, so we're, we're old regimental mates. Um, the notes here uh, say that um, Ted's a former politician. He was the, the, an MP from Etobicoke, but it's probably more honest to say he's not currently an MP. I, I doubt that he will never be heard from again. So, uh, but he's, uh, so I will let, uh, when he's ready, uh, Ted introduce his panel. Thank you, General. And the General was uh, my first CO, but, and thank you for those kind comments because I'm plotting my triumphant return as we speak. <laughs> but the ladies and gentlemen, we're, uh, we're very privileged to have uh, some absolutely outstanding people uh, on, uh, on our panel today. Of course, we have Dr. Stephanie Carvin, uh, we've got Howard uh, Mick Mickish, Mickish, sorry, and uh, Dr. Walter Perchel as well. And uh, I think everybody, since we're compressed a little bit, I won't read the entire uh, bio of everybody, but, um, but uh, additional points that are on the, uh, on the printed bio of our speakers is that um, Dr. Carvin worked as well uh, and advised the Government of Canada and, and advised uh, the U.S. Department of Defense Law, Law of War Working Group in 2009 on top of all the other uh, things that she's done and all the expertise that she's uh, had in the Government of Canada and, of course, in academia. And she's uh, well known for, uh, for, her, um, for her expertise in all of these areas. Um, Howard was also recently in, in Sudan, and he was there when the war began, but he's also done a lot of work in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Cameroon, and, uh, and he performed secure, uh, corporate security tasks there. Uh, so Howard, from his perspective, is going to have some very, very interesting things to say on uh, how we share information and, uh, and how we do that, both from his military background and, of course, his corporate background. And, of course, Lieutenant Colonel Walter Perchel, who, full, full disclosure, I've known for far, far, far too long, um, is... Uh, uh, also has had a tremendous uh, experience in, in his life, not only joining uh, the, the Royal Regiment of Canada and becoming the commander of that regiment, but also, of course, uh, within defense, within his teaching at uh, York University, and uh, was most recently at the, uh, attended the uh, Warsaw Security Forum on behalf of the NATO Association. So welcome to all of our speakers. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you can give it up. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what we're going to do is uh, our, all our speakers will speak in turn, starting with uh, Dr. Carvin. And um, they're going to lay out their positions and uh, their points and put some structure around the, uh, the discussion points. And uh, so each speaker has uh, up to 10 minutes to, uh, to give you an introduction. And then the way we're going to do this is, uh, rather than me, just ask questions uh, solely. We're also going to open it up to the room. And uh, we're going to be very interactive. So we're going to include the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, as we go along. Everybody okay with that? Perfect. NATO, NATO interns over there look very, very uh, uh, eager to go. So, uh, Dr. Carvin, if you wouldn't mind beginning. Sure, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Uh, okay, great, because I'm getting a, a message. I'm told I'm on an 8 by 10 screen, so I apologize for any blemishes. Um, uh. and also, Oh, and also I'd like to apologize for not being there in person. Unfortunately, I have caught a terrible bronchitis, and it's just prohibited me from really flying on airplanes and, and going uh, to do too much. So I really want to thank uh, General Mike Day for inviting me, as well as um, uh, Mr. Soule for accommodating me and, and having me present virtually, uh, and as all the other conference organizers. It's a real treat to be here, so if only virtually. So I'm going to do my best uh, in terms of presenting, and hopefully I come through okay. Uh, we don't create a hologram technology yet, but you know, future information warfare, it might be a thing. Um, so basically, I wanted to talk a little bit about today um, about uh, non-state instruments and kind of different techniques that are, that are going to be used in terms of um, future kinds of, of warfare and in the kind of areas that I think Canada, the, the future missions that I think Canada is going to be participating in, we may not have actually uh, committed to a peacekeeping operation, but I think it's uh, very important to realize that, uh, you know, in these little kind of areas where apparently we're going to be augmenting forces, that 
the, the, the kind, thinking about the kinds of strategy and tactics that are being used um, against uh, Canadian forces. So um, I thought it was useful to kind of maybe anchor this around the idea of hybrid warfare. And it's not an uncontroversial topic. There's a lot of people who think it's, it's um, a very old topic that you know, I've heard people describe the Trojan horse as a uh, kind of hybrid warfare. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of our allies think this is a real thing. They think this is something that is, is um, a, a very kind of new kind of warfare that they're unprepared for. And um, I know this because I've been participating in events with um, the Finnish, who just set up a center of excellence on hybrid warfare, as well as a lot of other European countries. We're trying to figure out um, how they need to go about doing this. <laughs> so, you know, whether or not we take this, the concept seriously, I think we need to realize that a lot of our allies actually do. And again, even though we may not find hybrid warfare to be the most persuasive concept, there's a lot in there that I think helps us to think about the kinds of problems that Canadian forces are going to be facing uh, going forward. Uh, I'm just seeing someone in front of me, so I'm hoping everything's okay. Everything's great. Um, so, um, Basically, hybrid warfare, I mean, there's a many different definitions of it. I'm going to use Frank G. Hoffman's movement, which is, he describes, he's the one who's probably popularized the term of the U.S. general, and he, he describes it as a range of different modes of warfare, including conventional uh, capabilities, irregular tactics and formations, terrorist acts, including indiscriminate violence and coercion and criminal disorder. And the criminal element here is going to be really important, I think, in, in um, what I'm about to say. <laughs> I think really, um, again, there's many different definitions of what hybrid warfare actually is, um, but I think we can kind of, most of the definitions usually work to at least four things. Um, firstly, a blending of different um, forms of warfare, right? So everything from a regular special operations all the way through to um, conventional forces. Secondly, a blending of battle space, and I think this is the most important. So we're not even just talking about the asymmetric conflict. We're talking about the electromagnetic sphere, talking about cyber warfare, talking about social media. All of these things are kind of blending together in the kinds of operations that we're seeing. Thirdly, I think we're seeing um, a breakdown in the traditional distinction between the military, civilians, but also, again, criminals as well, because the criminal element is, is um, really supporting, I think, a lot of what's going on here. And finally, a, a rejection of the traditional limits on warfare. Um, you know, you're not supposed to target civilians, but in the kind of blending of battle space that we see, I think we can argue pretty convincingly that civilians are being targeted in all kinds of um, uh, forms of warfare and in the kind of blending of battle space. You know, so when we think of um, hybrid warfare, the concept, again, flawed as it is, uh, kind of uh, came from actually Secretary of State James Mattis and Frank, uh, and again, Frank Hoffman, uh, Secretary, well, he wasn't now Secretary of State, he was General, now, sorry, now Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense James Mattis. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, continues to play out in the Trump administration. But they kind of built on the idea of Charles E. Krulak's famous three block war. And if you remember, this was the concept where there was um, a kind of conventional operations in one block, regular warfare in a second block. And in the third block, you had a humanitarian operations, and you're having to do all this at the same time. And on top of that, being filmed. Well, um, both Mattis and Hoffman added a fourth block to this, and this is what they call the high space. And again, I think this is where we might see some um, important, you know, we can look at the, the, some of the ideas that are coming forward and implications are for the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, the idea, again, really took off in 2006 when a lot of military thinkers, strategists, were trying to figure out um, what had happened during the Lebanese War in two, yeah, again, in 2006. And it basically, Hezbollah was able to put up a lot of opposition, more than a lot of people had thought. They looked at the different blending of tactics that Hezbollah very successfully used in order to draw Israel in um, in this conflict. They were able to use everything from kind of borderline conventional stuff, so using rockets, all the way through to kind of irregular tactics. So in trying to kind of understand what happened in that conflict, uh, again, this kind of hybrid concept took, uh, became popular. But of course, we refer to the concept today, I think, to refer to two different conflicts, uh, both of which Canada is actually participating in. The first sense, the uh, coalition against the Islamic State, 
And then secondly, the, um, what's happening in Eastern Europe right now, particularly with Russia. And um, really there's kind of aspects here that I think are important, or two kind of elements that I think are important. And in the first sense, you have kind of, again, the blending of a regular special operations forces and conventional forces. A lot of people don't remember that the Islamic State, a lot of their supporters were early kind of strategists and tacticians were actually a former Iraq army. So they actually had a lot of conventional knowledge, but I think we see this in the way that they were able to have military victories relatively early on. Um, and of course, um, we know that a lot of the you know resistance fighters or whatever in, in Ukraine, the little green men, uh, well, they were supported by the so-called little green men, the special operations forces, uh, and then later the conventional force as well. And then on the second half, of course, the second important element here is information warfare. And really, this kind of breaks down into three kind of elements. The first being uh, electronic warfare. So again, thinking about the electronic spectrum. And this is important because there's been a lot of criticism that NATO country had kind of left this case to live um, since the Cold War, whereas Russia had actually done a fairly decent job of keeping up their capabilities and improving on them. Um, the, the second thing, of course, is the cyber element. I'm sure there's a lot that's already been said about this, but the idea that you know you engage in, in cyber operations, and this is a big part of the Russian military today. And we've seen their capabilities in Georgia, Estonia, and of course, the Ukraine. And finally, um, there's the kind of information warfare and disinformation campaigns that we actually see. And in the case of the Islamic State, this is kind of where they fit in the information warfare picture, right? Their ability to use encrypted acts and their ability to disseminate propaganda very, very well, um, like no other um, terrorist group that we've really been able to see ever since. And of course, in the case of Russia, you know, their, you know, disinformation for them is not a new thing, but the way they've been able to harness it and attach it to social media platforms is remarkable. One of the things that I think is important to say at this point, though, is that Russia doesn't invent narratives, right? Russia finds political things, and as a, a good friend of mine, Clint Watts, who's testified to the Senate on this, has said that Russia is basically really good at finding social crack and turning it into capital, right? So they're picking up on these uh, tensions and then trying to find the most extreme voices and promote that along four different themes. The first is, of course, uh, political messages. They're trying to decrease trust in the democratic system and, of course, in countries such as Latvia. They're trying to say, well, your government's just a shill for the United States or the West, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, uh, you know, that, um, we've seen propaganda basically suggesting that Canadian forces are just kind of living off the Latvian, you know, Latvian people and they're taking money from them. So that's that's a real thing. Um, we also have actually, as you have said on the cyber element, we know that Russia has been successful in hacking into NATO members' phone, getting their personal information, and then walking up to them and saying, hey, look at what, like, look, this is you. Look at all the personal information I have. So there's a real cyber risk there as well. But the other three themes that we see Russia really kind of disseminate on is, uh, of course, um, financial propaganda, so trying to spread the idea that uh, imminent financial collapse because they want to create trust. Similarly, they kind of find things, uh, they cracks um, these social tensions, and try to amplify them against the most extreme or the voices. And finally, the idea of calamity, the idea that, um, you know, there's imminent, you know, what, you know, there's websites that track that kind of thing. Lots and one of the things we were suggesting the other day is that uh, there's, there's going to be some kind of simultaneous volcano eruption around the world uh, because they want people to be afraid. Because if people are afraid and they're saying, look, this isn't being reported in the media, you should distrust the media, that's really an, an advantage for them. So, as I'm kind of concluding here, I just want to maybe touch on um, three points from here on that I think are important for Canada as we think about these kinds of non-state um, elements and tools that are being used uh, in the kinds of conflicts that they think Canada is going to fight. And the, the first thing is that um, I think this is all really good and new, but we have to realize that these elements, these non-state elements, they're used well, but they tend to be used better when they're supported by conventional forces in the background. Um, the Islamic State had immediate military success because they were able to kind of use the knowledge of a lot of their conventional workers, uh, sorry, their um, conventional army officers. Um, secondly, uh, but sorry, 
And, and then what ended up happening was when uh, they were faced with a mighty army, their abilities um, kind of collapsed. They've lost their so-called elephant. And interestingly enough, the researcher Charlie Winter has argued that um, when, as, as ISIS has lost its caliphate, its ability to actually even engage in propaganda has really decreased as well. So the convention, the reliance on convention is, is still important in that context. And of course, in Ukraine, everyone makes a deal of the spring of 2014, but by the fall of 2014, it had largely become a conventional conflict uh, uh, supported by Russian forces. That conventional element is important. The second thing is, I think we have to realize that hybrid warfare, we often make it sound easy as if we can get a lot of bots out there and just make it happen. Uh, and that's not true. That, you know, and I, I found um, a good, there's a critic of the concepts who say, you know, there's a risk here that we're oversimplifying what hybrid warfare actually is. And they said, quote, one comes away with the image of a single hybrid warrior simultaneously targeting and firing altir uh, altir uh, artillery, sorry, setting an ambush with an IED, um, hiding among the population to which he is selling drugs and setting up protection rackets, developing and deploying biological and or nuclear weapons, and hacking into the Pentagon mainframe to insert a computer virus, all while conducting an interview on Al Jazeera, specifically targeted to destroy the murder among the civil, the civilian population of the American heartland. Right, so all of these are elements of kind of non-state actors, but it's a very hard thing to coordinate, and you do need a state in order to do that successfully, or a very well-run organization. The last point I would say is that every country in the NATO alliance is going to experience hybrid warfare, hybrid tech Needs, techniques we describe as hybrid, however you refer to them, in a different way. Um, how their experience in Finland is going to be different from how their experience from Canada. And we have to kind of figure out where Canada fits um, in this in terms of military and coalition operations. We can't just assume we can take a cookie cutter approach uh, for every armed forces. We have to figure out what specifically we need to know about how these different techniques are going to affect us and our needs our forces moving forward. So thank you very much. I hope that was okay. I hope I came through. I'm going to cough now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Well done, well done. Thank you, Stephanie. I think I have a new ambition. I want to be that hybrid warrior. <laughs> but I'm going to... I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to turn the uh, table over, or the uh, mic over to Howard. Howard, please. Oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just had a quick conversation with uh, General Day just beforehand, and uh, he'd like me to amp it up a bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. The, everyone's been speaking about uh, communications, cyber warfare, and this is all in the uh, European theater, I think. I think we're looking at developed nations here. And my experience in the last 10 years has been it, the world doesn't look like Canada, the world doesn't look like Europe. Uh, specifically, thinking of Africa, and when you're talking about cyber warfare, cyber information, uh, cyber intelligence, what we're talking about is a real lack of access. Most people in Africa just simply don't have the wherewithal to access the internet. So communicating with them in that way is simply not going to work for most of the people on the planet. So we have to be careful where we're going with this. The, the other point is, even though they have phone access, uh, it's very limited. And if anyone has ever been to Africa, your average person uh, rarely actually answers the phone. It's normally prearranged agreements. Uh, pick me up and I'll call you. The phone rings once, the driver shows up. No call was made. They they can buy internet access for as little as 10 cents, which buys them a few moments on the, on the internet. So the biggest way to communicate with them tends to be by text message. And this is a huge tool used by the government and actually been hijacked when I was in uh, South Sudan. Different companies have different people uh, employed. If you can get one of your tribal members on to that, whether it be Safaricom or, or Orange or whoever in Africa, and you can get them to access and send a text message to absolutely everyone on the network. This happens regularly. The government provides propaganda, 
and the counterinsurgents try like hell to get into that system and have managed to do it a few times. So that that telephone, which on one hand, I, I would propose is probably the best tool for development the world's ever seen. I, it's astonishing to see that, you know, your African, uh, a Kenyan Maasai warrior standing on the veldt talking on his cell phone. Yeah, but for maybe two seconds, right? So that everyone has general access, but the use of it is a lot lower than what you might expect. All right, so it's it's very different environment. There is another problem that really doesn't want to be addressed by the West because it sounds very racist. The average IQ for people who live in Africa is 70. I mean, you can look, cross-reference it and call me a liar, check it out online, you'll find it. No one can join the Canadian military without an IQ of 83. So the average person you're dealing with in Africa is much more open to rumor, that's huge, open to religion, another one. Because with an IQ, when you have half your population, perhaps with an IQ of 70 or less, they're not able to read, at least not at a comprehension level that we would expect in a democracy. So information flow to these people is very, very difficult. Religion has a huge impact, whether it be Islam or whether it be Christianity, whether it be the uh, uh, various smaller uh, religious groups. Actually, if I could handle, we could say one group that does a lot of good, it's probably the religious groups. They actually do a lot more good than most others. But the big key is government control of the internet. And right now, this is happening in, I'll give an example, Cameroon. The, uh, they have, they're actually fighting a war on two fronts. Uh, in the north, they have difficulty with uh, Boko Haram and quite a bit attack, their weekly attacks. But in the southwest, uh, under their initial formation as a nation, 25% of their citizens are English speakers, 75% are French speakers. And they have exactly the opposite problem or a mirror image problem of what Canada has, but they haven't come anywhere near close to solving it. So meanwhile, you're trying to battle terrorists in the north, you're trying to battle separatists in the south. And what the government's done is simply shut off the internet to that part of the country. You cannot access the internet. So governments have a huge amount of control here. Surprisingly enough, it's been my experience, the terrorist groups fighters, militaries, no one attacks the cell towers. No one shoots up the cell tower. It's absolutely astonishing. In the middle of South Sudan where fuel is so expensive and that you would really like to have it that no one jumps over the fence into the non-supervised, non-security uh, fence line where you jump in, steal the diesel that runs the generator that keeps the cell phone tower going. And nobody does it because everyone needs it. Everyone uses it. It's like the roadway system. So having that open, the only people that close that, in my experience, have been the governments because they want to control it. So I, I see government in Africa is, as an impediment. And government's control of radio and media, radio and TV. Uh, some people mention the CBC here. I think they should register as a foreign agent. <laughs> I don't really believe the government should be in that. Or at least, if you're going to call it psych, you know, PSYOPs, call it PSYOPs. Don't call it the CBC. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So enough of that personal opinion. I, I'm glad I got a few jokes out of there. Uh, but countering the threat is, is, is very important. And uh, there are three ways to do it. White, gray, and black. Black generally doesn't work. And that eventually it's a lie that will be found out. And as we know, the Soviet Union is very good, Soviet Union, Russia is very good at that, uh, putting out that kind of a line, but it, it's black propaganda. White propaganda, on the other hand, is using our information that we want to put out in our instruments, whether it be the internet, whether it be uh, newspapers, and I'm thinking in a country that's less developed without the internet access that this would be print. Because in a country with very little access to, to digital information, 
The guy who has a printing press is king. If you own the printing press, you own it. And in, I sometimes think in less developed countries that we're not realizing that. Because it's not just the internet. Not there, not yet. So you need to control the printing presses. Surprising. So, for example, what can you do with that? Well, in, in uh, Afghanistan, we had our own newspaper. Probably the best newspaper in the country. Put out in three languages. Three languages, English, Pashto, and Dari. A whole uh, set of people to put this together. And uh, I like to think of that as one of my actual uh, successes in my career, in my life. Uh, we had a very good general at the time. I think we're all quite familiar with General Hillier, who was uh, very much uh, interested in information warfare and the message and dealing with the local people. And he saw the, the PSYOP section, in particular our print journalism the, in a newspaper we called Sadaya Zadi, as one of his tools of firepower, if you would like to put it that way. Because you could put your information out and it becomes, it's not ephemeral. Something on the internet becomes ephemeral. The newspaper ends up being put, put up in people's homes. Pictures end up being kept. In a country that doesn't have any color photography, the newspaper that has color is the one that everybody reads. And the one that has the multiple languages is, everyone, is the one that people read. And now when you've got sides that are against each other reading the same thing rather than their own created stories, they're reading your narrative that you've translated into their language, which becomes a three-way narrative. Now, this is not simple to do. This I would, I would and, I, and I think Ted may agree with me on this, we're getting down to such fine messaging that this is the kind of skill that you would find in, a, in an election platform, in the people working in uh, an election. And too often, the military has a heck of a lot of good military officers, but none of us knows how to do this. And this takes people with civilian experience to be able to get this out, working for the commander. Make no mistake, this is working for the commander when, at, at this level. So to create that. So you need to be able to counter those tactics, okay? So you have gray, we haven't covered yet. White, honest. Black, lies. Gray, huh. A lot of flexibility in here. We can do a lot. All right, I like Mr. So-and-so because I like what he's writing and it sounds like something I want, so I want to hire or I want to buy his copyright for that article through somebody else to put in my publication. Perfectly legal, but now he's working for me now. So I've hijacked somebody else. And believe me, writers will sell to anybody anything that they can sell. So an opinion article written, say, in Afghanistan by a pro-Western uh, writer in Abu Dhabi, purchased, put it in the newspaper, put the man's name on it, be clear where it came from, all right? But he doesn't know, has to know who bought it. The other way to do gray, and this one uh, actually was quite surprising to me in Afghanistan. We created such a great product that when a copy was taken across the border to Pakistan, a Pakistan news magazine just flat out copied the whole thing and put it out as theirs. <laughs> How you couldn't ask for any better. The commander's message is now not just tactical, it's gone strategic. And then not by what we've done, but by creating a product that people want to read that's better than the other guy's product. And I think whether we talk about the internet or we're talking about hard paper, that's what we're talking about. We're selling a better product. Okay, okay so following up on that uh, as polling and feedback, we made some uh, good uses of this in the past that I have with uh, ex-intelligence officers. Make me a polling plan. How do people react? Go visit the wives. They never get out, talk with them. Let's hire some women. Let's get out of here. Let's see what, what we can come up with. What you come up with is a treasure trove of intelligence. You have people, people at home. And you have your people in people's homes answering your questions. Civilians that you've hired and given jobs to. You're influencing and being subversive just by hiring a woman in that circumstance. 
So you can influence not only directly, but drag information out of it. And this information, this intelligence, can be worked on and used as counterintelligence. Because who's in the neighborhood? Whose family's linked to who? Who's got what tribal clan loyalties? Too often these are missed, even in Afghanistan, by the intelligence corps. All right, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. Uh, after talking that, I'm going to talk about private security companies, other influencers of the battlefield, if you want to sit before it actually happens. And basically, this comes down to information gathering. Corporate entities are as desperate for information as countries are. Where a country might risk its people, its soldiers, and its money, a company is going to risk its money and its reputation to go in and complete a contract. And they don't want to fail. And they don't want to lose people. And they don't want to be sued. So there's a whole lot, there's a huge pull from large co international companies to develop this kind of information and create security from it. Now, I, what I'm going to talk about now perhaps is more along the lines of telling you a story than anything else, but I will give you an example. There are huge assets out there available to both NATO countries and Canada itself. And these are your own citizens who are working. And I'll use my time in South Sudan as a, as a perfect example. There were about 40 men who were classified as what we would call security advisors. People like me who worked for a particular company or a particular aid organization, not government, not UN. And there were about 40 of us. We had to advise all our organizations. Well, how do you do that without having information? The military doesn't share. The UN does not share. The Red Cross doesn't share. So you set up your own network. So as each company or each advisor supports a company doing something different, you have people all over the country. And they all start supporting that. And then you end up on a Skype group. And they end up sharing information. So you actually have a hard, hard set of information flow going on where it's all shared by people who've been in, invited to attend a group. Yet this has never been tapped by any embassy, even though it's been offered. Huge amount of information flows that come through. In fact, if you recall in Juba when the war kicked off last year in, in uh, the summer of 2016, you might have heard that one of the uh, compounds, the uh, a tourist hotel as it was called, was uh, broken into by the Afghan or by the uh, uh, South Sudan military, and the aid workers were raped and several people were killed. Well. I followed that in real time. Their security manager was Skyping out right to the end when he wrote, they're breaking down the door, I'm going to, to destroy my phone. Now meanwhile, we called the United Nations. I called the head of security myself personally. Everyone had called on the United Nations. Less than one kilometer from your gate, there's a war atrocity being committed. The UN didn't act on it didn't do anything. No one could. Not the government. It came down to private security company again, led by a Westerner to go in and rescue the last of the people and bring them to a safe place. None of these people have ever been debriefed by their, by their governments, at least I don't know, or at least they never were at that time. So what I, the point I'm trying to make here, there's a, there's a huge amount of information to be had. We can get a huge amount of information in our system, but we don't seem to want to use it. There's a lot more to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. General Day was right. You're very tentative. <laughs> Walter, please. Um, OK, we're looking at the future of war. The future of war is it's, is. is Sorry, does this, this, guy, this guy work? This guy's dead. You put the ON switch in the ON position. Is that the way it works? Yeah, works. The signals officer taught me that a long time ago. Well, so the signals officer was wrong. There we are. Okay, we're talking about the future of war. The future of war is, in fact, it's past. Um, 
A very clever Greek about 2,000 years ago made the following observation, only the dead shall know war no more. We are, in fact, in the 21st century at war. We are simply at war by other means, to paraphrase Clauschwitz. What is other means? The preoccupation right now is the other means is hybrid warfare. Um, or the Gerasimov doctrine, or a combination of both. I'm not sure about that. I think this is what soldiers referred to as a shiny thing. Um, all of this stuff that makes up the discussions about hybrid warfare and a lot of the other things, including the Gerasimov doctrine, is certainly very useful for discussions in staff colleges and at universities, but at the end of the day, there's nothing there that's new except for one thing, technology and its application. That's what's new. And that makes it look different, but really there is nothing that has happened here that has not been done in the past. If you're a student of history, you'll find all the bits and pieces. So with great respect to General Gerasimov, he didn't invent this. Um, a lot of people are talking about evolution and warfare. What I want to do today in this discussion of future warfare is I'm breaking it down a little differently for the purposes of engaging you on this. I'm breaking this down into three categories. Um, the first category in the 21st century of warfare, as I see it, is non-kinetic operations. And the reference here is largely, though not exclusively, directed at what we call information operations with various actors. And I want to break that into the activities, the actors, and the outcomes. So information operations are, as an earlier speaker said this afternoon, preparation of the battle space. Okay, we don't do things to do things, we do things for the purpose. And preparation of the battle space in what? In what I'm defining as the ongoing war of the 21st century. We are constantly preparing the battle space with a view to those we identify as our enemies. And who are our enemies? That depends on who you are, yeah? Because we have, even in polite company, though we don't point fingers and sometimes we don't say states, we've got a pretty good idea who that is. Okay, who are the actors in this non-kinetic dimension of the war of the 21st century? Well, certainly the state is an actor. And the state is either an open actor or a less than honest actor, but states invariably are actors. But in the 21st century, they're not the only actors. So certainly states are engaged in pursuing their political interests and their political end states, but again, they're not the only game in town. Other actors, non-state actors, and non-state actors is a lovely term because you can put a lot of people into that basket. But non-state actors range from the individual who's angry and perhaps talented or perhaps less so, all the way to the more sophisticated people that are taking up so much of our cognitive space, people that are the engines behind bots, trolls, and other new technology applications. Other actors, agents of influence, states with political purposes, and groups with political purposes, including non-state actors, pursue the development of agents of influence. We find them all over the place. If your target is a specific state, Agents of influence are terribly important, and by the way, also terribly old. Paid sources, people that do things because they get paid. Look, we've known about the methodology behind contracting this type of work for a long time. It's that lovely little acronym, MICE, Money, Ideology, Compromise, Ego. Using one of those four things, you can press a button that's going to get you a lot of what you want without putting your fingerprints on it. So pick one. There's a guy that pleaded guilty yesterday, a Canadian from Ancaster. What did he plead guilty to? To doing a whole bunch of really nasty things, and it turns out on behalf of the FSB. And his name is Baratov, a guy that used to run around in very expensive cars smoking very expensive cigars. And what did, he find, what did we find out about him according to his plea in an American court? because we facilitated his extradition to the Americans, that he was acting on behalf of the FSB with a view to acquiring what was essentially intelligence-based materials. Compromise sources. These are people that are owned, again, coming out of the mice environment. Politicians. It's an interesting time, the 21st century. Somebody observed this is the age when 
No offense, Ted. We often see, certainly I won't use the word always, a time when politicians are criminals and criminals are politicians. Think about some of the leaders of the 21st century and see how many of them fall into that interesting category. This is an interesting time. And again, I underline with great respect to my friend Ted, not all. Second category of activity, kinetic operations in various dimensions. Okay, again, who are the actors here? Oh, let me back up, half step back, I forgot one piece. What's the purpose of all these non, or what's the purpose of these non-kinetic operations? Essentially, there's a multiplicity of purposes, but I would define them as follows. Distract, dismiss, distort, dismay, and undermine the institutions and the actors of the target, okay? You're there to mess things up. So why do the Russians support right-wing parties in France? Because it hurts France, yeah? Why do you support Brexit? Because it's good to the greater task, the greater target of breaking down the European Union, which is a hostile actor in terms of the Russian end state. Why do you support Golden Dawn in Greece? Why do you support right-wing groups? Why do you support left-wing groups? Why do you put money anywhere and why do you support those organizations? Because ultimately it speaks to your end state. Kinetic activities. Again, the actors here. The range of activities is very broad. The actor in kinetic activities goes from, again, the individual to the non-state actor, proxies, contractors like my friend, false flag operators, people who think they're doing it on behalf of their religion or their ideology or again simply because they're getting paid. Assassination, I noticed there's a lovely uptick in the 21st century of car accidents and heart attacks. Pretty old school stuff out of the 50s and the 60s but it's back with a vengeance. People are apparently contracting all kinds of maladies rather unexpectedly. Certainly espionage. Espionage is as I am told the most rapidly growing business of the 21st century. And the only issue is breaking it apart from public to private because both sides are engaged in espionage. Certainly the private sector and industrial espionage, but certainly not just the private sector because the state may very well be the supplier of that espionage. You've already made mention of the fact that when you get on somebody's airplane, and I won't point any fingers here, you don't have to get as far as the state. You can get on somebody's airline and they'll download you. If you're carrying anything electronic, which I no longer do, other than a phone, you're going to get downloaded. Insurgency. You can facilitate insurgency. And again, that's a matter of supporting the right people, providing the right resources, and you can still keep your fingers off that. Low intensity conflict. Low intensity conflict, for example, the Philippines. Okay, a low intensity conflict can be su supported and facilitated by money raised on the other side of the world, perhaps in a place like Saudi Arabia or some other place. Mid to high level warfare. Yemen, this is starting to get a little bit more intense. Can you facilitate that? Can you participate in that? Can you push that directly or by proxy? And the answer is yes. Or the war of the 21st century using the new technologies when it becomes both really interesting, terribly challenging, and potentially catastrophic. Think about, we have a distinguished guest, an American friend who comes from Kansas. I'd like you to think for a second about a nuclear weapon detonated 20 kilometers over Kansas. The consequences of that nuclear weapon detonated 20 kilometers over Kansas are an EMP pulse that effectively takes out the entire North American continent and puts us in the Stone Age from anywhere from weeks to years. It's the end of civilization as we know it. We are actually technologically behind North Korea at that point. This is stunning and this is different because it was never possible in the past to make war this way. Not to make war but to make it this way. Nuclear or dirty bombs, we are certainly looking at the prospect and the possibility of both of those eventualities right now. Chemical warfare, it has been used and it will be used again. And of course my personal great hang up that my graduate students hear me 
reflecting on very often biological warfare. There's a new technology or relatively new technology called CRISPR, which allows the average person to do recombinant engineering. And I'm not talking about average, the guy walking up University Avenue, but certainly somebody that's skilled. Now that's an extraordinary technology because we've proliferated the capacity to make biological weapons literally to the entire planet. That's a pretty dumb thing to do. Because you have to ask yourself a question, in this range of actors I'm postulating from the individual to the state, can we find somebody out there that's angry? Angry enough to want to kill some people. And can we find somebody that's prepared to use technology? Well, I'll tell you where you can find them. You can find them in all the universities in Toronto and they're in science programs. And they're in information technology programs. We are educating our own demise. Third category, very quickly, cyber, and this is the one that most of us have reflected on today. Um, the author Klimberg makes this observation, and I enjoyed it very much, and since it's already after lunch, it's time to lighten up the audience. So he says, cyber used to be about sex, but now it's about war. And he is exactly correct. Cyber is war. In fact, the great shots of the cyber war were fired when we identified this thing called Stuxnet running around the planet. We changed the game. There are no rules. You can attack another country. You can do what if you had done it with a different technology would have resulted in open war. You can do the same thing because we don't know the rules of that war yet. We have no rules for that war, but you can certainly pursue it. I want to reflect on that very quickly as well. Cyber whole lot of actors, a whole lot of possibilities and, po and prospects. All the way from cyber commands, the United States, Russia, China, Iran, Israel, all the way from cyber commands, very sophisticated, incredible resources, lots of technology, down to an individual. What is the greatest weapon of mass destruction in the 21st century? A computer and somebody that's smart enough to use it. Who is going to attack a nuclear plant with 50 guys and high explosive. Nobody in his right mind. The way you make a Fukushima event is you use a computer to do it. Because ladies and gentlemen, in the internet of things, there's not a nuclear plant on the planet that can protect itself from a dedicated cyber attack. And that is very bad news for the rest of us. How much damage can you do? The answer to all questions in life, as I tell my graduate students, is it depends. You can go and hack away and be miserable and cause failures and DDS attacks and all kinds of other things, or you can get really, really nasty. You can go all the way up to something called the fire sale, a three-phase attack on an entire economy and an entire country, and this one's been done, by the way. You go after transportation first. It's easy to crash trans transportation. It's a completely open system. Second phase, finance and telecoms. Would it be possible to do that in the city of Toronto? And by the way, if you take out Toronto, you do take out Canada. Yeah? And of course, phase three utilities, including something that was never meant to be a utility and is not regulated, but is the single most dangerous utility of them all, or perhaps second. And that's the internet itself, because that's the vehicle by which you get access and the ability to do all of these terrible things. Okay. So, when and how is all of this going to happen? And again, the answer to that is, it depends. The people that perpetrate and choose to pursue war in this 21st century are going to be affected by the following variables. The first and more important, most important variable in the pursuit of 21st century war is political intent and political will. Okay, who has the political intent and the political will to take somebody else down? Are you prepared? Yes, two minutes, no problem, we can do this. Okay, are you prepared to execute on the basis of political will and political intent? Can you think just off the top of your head of any international actor that has both political will and political intent, I can think of a couple. Having a strategic plan, and a strategic plan is different than the plan that the democracies have because we don't have strategic plans. We don't have strategic plans because at the core of our system 
is an inability to generate strategic plans. And that is a function of the nature of our democracies. You can't create long-term strategic plans in a four-year election cycle. It's impossible. And even if you do, the next government, as Ted knows, is going to change the plan anyway. Having the necessary resources to operationalize the plan. Resources are a doable thing. And as the price of oil goes up for the Russians, and as the Chinese economy goes up, your resources increase. And I'm not pointing fingers here. Having the time to operationalize the plan. This is a long game in the 21st century. You're not playing for next week. You may be playing, as was referenced earlier by one of our earlier speakers, to 2050. That's nothing that we in the West understand or so anybody in Europe understands. Unity of command. Can we get everybody on side? Not in the democracies. We debate amongst ourselves harshly and all the time. We criticize. We challenge. We say you can't do that. And there's a, there is a constituency in society will support the you can't do that side of that. Seizing and maintaining the initiative. Can you do that in a democracy? And the answer is again, no, you can't. You can't, which means you have, by definition in the 21st century, yielded the ground to the attacker, not the defender. You cannot do this. And last, and perhaps most, most importantly, and again referenced earlier by one of our speakers, speed. The 21st century is about the speed of light. How quickly can you prosecute an attack, and is it quickly enough to destroy the other guy? And the answer is yes, you can. So, finally, the more dependent, for every day we move forward in time, as I've told my graduate students, we become more dependent upon technology, and as a result, we become more vulnerable to that technology. The more complex our societies become, the more likely they are to fail, and the gap between our capacity to adapt to that opportunity or that circumstance and our ability to get past it is, in fact, collapsing. The probability of failure, ladies and gentlemen, in the 21st century is imminent. Thank you, Walter. It was very insightful. And if you think that was great, you should have a beer with him. It's all good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start off with, uh, with a few questions, and we're going to open it to, uh, to the audience. I'm going to start off with Stephanie. Stephanie, um, you were talking about, of course, uh, hybrid war and, and the use of division within European states. Uh, I'd be interested in your comments on um, Russian effectiveness in uh, Europe with its, um, with its use of RT, other forms of information warfare, and, and perhaps uh, its ability to affect um, uh, movements and, uh, and organizations uh, like, uh, for example, Le Pen in France, uh, Brexit, and so forth. Can you comment on that? Oh, okay. Um, thank you for this. Um, the only thing, I just feel compelled to say this, is that I, I think anyone who's thinking intelligence and race, that's wrong. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm concerned if on a panel with someone who's linking intelligence and race. I think that science is not there, and that needs to be publicly openly refuted. Um, secondly, with regards to Russian effectiveness, I would suggest that um, the ability to affect really, again, is country specific. And a lot of it um, depends on the ability for Russia to kind of capitalize on native narratives that are actually there and going forward. Um, you know, the ability for Russia to create narratives is pretty bad. Uh, Russia has put out, you know, it's tried to put its own propaganda. No one really takes RT seriously because they know um, where the propagandas come from. So when it has attacked Latvians or, or tried to suggest some things to Latvians, a lot of this has not been particularly effective. We know that support for Canadian forces in that country are very good. But when it's able to pick up on narratives that are coming from the countries themselves, so concern about immigration, concern about refugees, concern about other kinds of um, uh, disorder and chaos that are going on, it's able to pick up on these narratives and then amplify them. So I think we need to understand the success of Russian propaganda efforts as amplification as opposed to creation. And yes, we do see it in some areas, um, such as, uh, again, on, on the discourse around refugees and its ability to kind of 
coordinate with groups in Poland who are putting forward anti-immigration and in a lot of cases anti-Semitic and full-on racist messages as well. So, you know, but it's going to be interesting to see right now. We're also seeing some calls for investigations. Did Russian bots support the Brexit effort in the same way that they supported the Donald Trump 2016 election? So that, I think, remains to be seen. But again, I think the way we need to look at Russia in particular in these European societies as amplifying messages that are already there and not necessarily being a very good source of derogation. Thank you. Howard, one of the things I took from your comments is the information that is in Africa right now that you had mentioned. No embassies are actually taking advantage of and corporations locally are trading information for their benefit. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how Canada, because we now have a focus, even perhaps an increased focus on Africa right now, how should Canada take advantage of the available information? Well, that's a bit difficult. One, if we're talking strictly Canadian embassies, Canadian embassies need to be more open. It's been my experience that they don't like Canadians, and I haven't been able to enter a Canadian embassy overseas since 2003. You show your passport, you're lucky if you see Canadian. Their point is they do not want to serve Canadians. That's not their job. Their job is to represent the country. So, okay, that, that's fine. Uh, but it is, it is difficult. The, the one thing that, that should happen, I, I believe, as far as intelligence gathering is going, I'm astonished we don't have a CSIS agent in each one of our embassies, especially in these third world countries or developing countries and nations that are, are at war. This information, I would think, would be valuable to our government in deciding where to put its aid, where where to put its diplomatic efforts. And there are several different groups that, uh, that are available. One is, uh, and often the Americans lead in this, they're the biggest. Uh, it's a group or an organization they, they support called the Overseas Security Advisory Council, the OSAC, OSAC. And that's an excellent forum. And it's an invited only forum and held by the Americans and various foreigners in a in a, in a country are invited to talk about security issues. And it's a very great forum. I have yet to see Canadian there, or Canadian government representative. You see lots of Canadians who are working security, but you don't see anyone representing the government. So that, that, that's one way to do it. But the other thing I'm surprised that, given I'm, the fact that I'm logged in and out of this country now, and they know exactly where I've gone, that nobody's debriefed me. I, I, I'm absolutely astonished. <laughs> I've been more places than than the military has, and, and I have yet to be debriefed. So that there, there are assets that are available to the Canadian government, whether it be citizens or the people who have dual citizenship. Well, I'll give you a rule, for example. In South Sudan, I got an, uh, there was an invitation to come to a garden party at the embassy. I was astonished. I thought I'd be one of about five people. When I got there, there were five people. Four of them were military, one of them was me, and 25 were South Sudanese Canadians. They had managed to get to Canada as a refugee, been here long enough to get a passport, and then went back home to try and start businesses. Surprisingly enough, they all ended up in a lot of difficulty. Uh, during the war, and this happens to a lot of dual citizenship holders, and I, and, and I point this out as a warning, and I've seen this more than once. During the war, they uh, were encouraging foreigners to leave, that's fine. All right, but you have to have your passport and it certainly had to have the visa stamps on it that you paid your fees, et cetera, and you'd done it legally. Well, a lot of the Sudanese Canadians had traveled in on their South Sudanese passport. So there were no visas on their Canadian passport. And when they tried to leave using their South Sudan passport, they said South Sudanese are not allowed to leave the country by air from this airport today. And when they pulled out the Canadian passport and said, well, if you're declaring a Canadian citizen, you've been in this country illegally. And they took several of them to jail. So it's difficulty in using uh, two passports, two citizenships. Uh, and these are just examples. I suppose I'm, I'm trailing off and I'm telling you stories about the difficulty of operations. But this, 
these are, are real concerns. Thank you, Howard. Walter, in, in your comments, one of the things you said is we're basically educating our own demise uh, within the, the sciences and universities. How, how would you suggest we mitigate that and stop it at its core? Well, this, this is an interesting and challenging question. The, you know, I, I reflect on a friend of mine who is probably one of the smartest bioscientists on the planet. Um, he's got, you know who he is, he's got almost 200 American patents in biotechnology. And the question is, how do you decide the difference between what he does with his ability in bioscience and what somebody else is going to do? And we have no effective way to know that. We have no way to know what's between somebody's ears or what their intent is. The fact is, we have no effective way to stop people who have traditionally facilitated access to an open society to facilitate interests against that very same open society. We've done it historically, and it has come back to bite us. Is there an effective way to stop that? Or should we, in fact, stop that? No, I believe I'm a big supporter of foreign students, uh, of exchange education, but I think the only mechanism that you can put into place is something that has its own liability, and that is the liability of increasing intelligence operations against one's own citizens. This is the grand question for democracies in the 21st century finding the balance between security and individual rights. And we have not addressed that as a nation. We are simply allowing ourselves to fall down a slippery slope following the example of our cousins in the United States who, when they passed the Patriot Act, in my view, fundamentally altered 800 years of democratic tradition because they violated the base, most basic of rights, habeas corpus. I think everybody needs to be entitled to that because if that's not the core of our democracy, then there is no democracy. But how do we get that far? I don't know. I think the only picket fence we can put up is aggressive intelligence with great oversight. And that's something we do not practice in this country. Thank you, Walter. Opening it to the floor. Catherine Lang, me hold. And it's not a question. It is very well documented, not just in Africa, but right here in Canada, all over the world. If babies and mothers don't get enough fat, they don't get enough protein, the brain can't develop. It's just a documented fact. It has nothing to do with race, but it does have a meaning of access. And that's one of the things that NATO has tried to do with security. But a lot of organizations don't do that. That's why that new peanut food is so good, because it has fat protein. So it's something for us to think about if we're assisting the world that we want people to have critical thinking and brains. Yeah. Anybody else? Where are you, General? Well, again, I want to thank uh, this panel for uh, a, 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 an excellent hour. The, uh, I must say, when uh, Walter had, had finished his remarks, um, although I had heard the sort of thing before the last time I felt that way was in 1959 walking out of the theater having seen on the beach and figuring it, that was the end of it that was the end of it anyway and the other the other part uh, when I was introducing Ted I, I didn't mention that he had been the commanding officer of the Lincoln and Welland regiment guarding the Niagara frontier so you know to give you your proper due so thank you very much panel